Oprah business. <laughs> Oprah coming next. Oprah. <laughs> <laughs> Once I establish this as a place of truth. Yeah. Oh yeah. Watch. And what I realized with the club is what makes them so mad is when you don't want to be a part of it. Hey everyone, let's talk about the wild ride that is the entertainment industry. Seriously, it's been living up to its name with all the daily drama. Now, it looks like Ice Cube has decided to jump into the mix, adding some spice to the ongoing spectacle. You remember how Cat Williams caused a stir and practically broke the internet a few weeks into the new year, right? It had people taking sides and everything. Well, it seems like Ice Cube is rumored to be Team Cat, suggesting that there might be more bombshells to come. And guess whose name popped up? None other than the queen herself. OPR Winfrey. Yep, you heard that right. The grapevine is buzzing with whispers that Ice Cube is hinting at Cat Williams having more revelations up his sleeve, and OPR might be one of the names in the spotlight. But wait, there's more. Rumor has it that Ice Cube is suggesting OPR could be feeling a bit jittery about what Cat might spill. Now, if you haven't caught wind of the rumors, there's been some talk about OPR being a bit shady and allegedly involved in some not so great stuff. So, the idea that she might be a tad nervous about Cat Williams shining a light on her? Well, it's making waves in the gossip circles. So, let's unravel this mystery together. What exactly is Ice Cube all about? And why does Oprah supposedly have the jitters? Let's get into it. All right, so you might be wondering what's up with Ice Cube throwing his support behind Cat Williams, especially when it seems like a lot of their fellow celebs are ready to throw some serious shade at Cat. Well, here's the scoop. Ice Cube and Cat Williams go way back. Like, they've teamed up multiple times, creating this hilarious duo on screen that we've all enjoyed in classics like Friday After Next and First Sunday. Their chemistry is on point, and you can tell they've got that comedic magic. So it's no wonder why Ice Cube is backing Cat Williams up. Now let's dive into why OPR Winfrey might be feeling a bit uneasy about Cat's potential revelations. So the rumor mill is churning out some pretty wild stuff, whispers that OPR is supposedly a handler for the Hollywood elite. Yeah, it's some next level conspiracy talk. According to these rumors, OPR isn't exactly the philanthropic champion champion for rights image we all know. Instead, she's accused of using her Hollywood influence to help the elite control black artists. Now, you might have heard about the accusations by Taraji P. Henson, claiming that OPR didn't have the backs of black women in the industry as much as she portrayed. Shocking, right? OPR, the queen of philanthropy, being accused of not looking out for her own? The rumors suggest that OPR has been playing a different game, turning black actors into puppets for the industry's elite to control and carry out their mysterious agendas. It gets even juicier. The rumors claim OPR has allegedly been using her show to set up black artists for failure just because she felt like it or because her so-called masters wanted her to. Crazy, right? And apparently this has been going on for a long time, but folks were too scared of OPR to speak up. All right, let's rewind a bit to the late 90s and early 2000s, that era, when OPR show was the go-to spot for black artists to promote their stuff. OPR used to boast about being all about supporting black talent and giving them a platform, you know? Well, here's where it gets interesting. The rumors say that wasn't exactly the real deal. According to the Gossip Grapevine, OPR supposedly worked against a bunch of black artists on her show, even though she claimed to be their biggest fan. But wait, there's more drama. The rumors are pointing fingers at OPR for allegedly shutting down artists who dared to speak out against her and spill the tea on her anti-black reputation. The one who kicked off this revelation party was ludicrous, calling out OPR for using her show to trash the works of artists and basically make them look like something they're not. Ludacris had his own run-in with her way back in 2005. So Luda and the crew from Crash hit up OPR show to promote the movie, right? Sounds cool, but nah, OPR had some other plans. Instead of giving Ludacris a chance to talk about his role. She straight up put him on blast for using the N-word in his music. Luda wasn't having it though. In an interview, he spilled the beans saying, I was there for Crash the movie. And basically she said something about not agreeing with my music, but she thought I did great in the movie. Yeah. And basically she said something about not agreeing with my music, but she thought I did great in the movie. And of course I was up there with the whole cast of Crash. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't necessarily feel like that needed to be said. And even if you don't agree, with certain songs I made, say you don't agree with certain songs, don't say you just don't agree with all of my right. views. Right. Now here's where it gets messed up. Luda, being the smart dude he is, fired back with some real talk, but OPR wasn't having any of it. She cut out Ludacris's comeback, making it look like he just took the hit without saying a word. Luda spilled the tea, saying, she was able to say what she said, and then I had my rebuttal. And when I saw the final show, her words were in there. It was in there, but mine weren't in there, so it just looked like I kind of took it. And the crazy part is, the ludicrous thing with OPR wasn't even a case of some personal 
or feud. It was just out of the blue, which makes it all the more mind-boggling. But according to the rumors swirling around, Ludacris was just the tip of the iceberg, giving us a glimpse into what OPR might be capable of doing to innocent artists just because she feels like it. But hold on to your hats because there's more tea brewing. Remember when OPR seemingly tried to throw shade at the king of pop, Michael Jackson, after he passed away? Now that's hitting below the belt. Here's the backstory. MJ played a significant role in OPR Rise to Fame back in 93 when he granted her a super important interview at his Neverland Ranch. Now, for someone like Michael who was notoriously private, inviting OPR into his home was a big deal. OPR, of course, rode that interview to bragging rights, claiming she and MJ were practically besties. But fast forward to after Michael's passing, and OPR did a complete 180. She attempted to tarnish his legacy by highlighting the allegations against him, especially in the wake of the Neverland documentary. And here's where it gets messy. She interviewed Wade Robson and James Safechuck, the guys who had previously accused MJ of some serious stuff, like essaying them. Now the wild part is, these accusers actually retracted their statements saying they had accused MJ wrongly and he wasn't the they had painted him as. So why did OPR decide to kickstart a whole new campaign against Michael Jackson? People are raising eyebrows suggesting that OPR might just be looking out for number one, herself. It's like she cares more about her own agenda than the truth or the feelings of those involved. It gets even juicier when OPR faced the music for her actions and she went all defensive, claiming she was just trying to raise awareness about SA in the industry. But here's where it gets a bit eyebrow raising. OPR sudden championing of the hash me too cause seems a tad hypocritical you see, she's got these strong ties with none other than Harvey Weinstein, the guy who's been accused of, you guessed it, S.A. Now, how does that work? OPR, the supposed advocate against S.A., rubbing elbows with someone in the industry who's facing those very allegations? British actress Katie Ann Noble also spoke on this. According to Katie, she was wowed when she first met Weinstein at a London event, where he was chilling with supermodel Naomi Campbell. And to top it off, OPR was hanging off his arm like they were the ultimate trio. She spilled the beans in a tear press conference in Manhattan to discuss the SEXTFK lawsuit she filed a day earlier against Weinstein in Manhattan Federal Court, sharing how she initially thought Weinstein had something fantastic in store for her when she met him in London. Fast forward to Cannes in 2014, she innocently brings her showreel to his hotel room, thinking it's all business. But, surprise, surprise, once inside, Weinstein doesn't give a hoot about her showreel. Instead, he starts getting touchy-feely while casually throwing in the idea of hooking her up with a model agency in London. Talk about a plot twist. Noble joins the lineup of actresses and models claiming Weinstein crossed the line, using promises of career boosts to get what he wanted. And this is someone OPR been rubbing shoulders with for years. All right, quick recap for those not in the loop. Harvey Weinstein, big shot American filmmaker, became the poster boy for the Hash Me Too movement. You know, that whole wave exposing SA. So rewind five years, and what had been the gossip in Hollywood's back alleys finally went public. News broke with these explosive articles, spilling the tea that Weinstein had been messing with and harassing loads of women for, like, forever. The guy wielded his power like a bully, strong-arming them into keeping quiet. Ronan Farrow spilled some major details in The New Yorker back in November 2017. Turns out Weinstein wasn't just sitting around twiddling his thumbs, he went all out and hired this British-Israeli detective squad called Black Cube to shut down those abuse allegations. Picture this, undercover agents with fake IDs, shady meetings with journalists and actresses like Rose McGowan, and a whole web of espionage to keep things under wraps. Weinstein apparently had Black Cube, Kroll, and a bunch of other agencies on speed dial, all working to dig up dirt on dozens of people and even creating psychological profiles that dug deep into their personal, and yeah, you guessed it, SEX histories. This guy reportedly tried pulling Woody Allen, Ronan's father, into his mess, hoping Allen would help shut down Ronan Farrow from exposing the claims of SA against him. Allen, though, decided to sit that one out and declined to get involved, but that's not all. Weinstein wasn't just twiddling his thumbs, he apparently roped in Black Cube again to put the squeeze on journalists Megan Tohe and Jody Cantor, the ones digging into the allegations against him. According to Cantor, a Black Cube agent went undercover, posing as a women's rights advocate, trying to pull some manipulation magic. Cantor even went to Hillary Clinton for help, but it seems the politics of it all got tangled. In October 2017, the New York Times and the New Yorker reported that more than a dozen women accused Weinstein of S.A.ing, A.ing, or 
R wording them. Many other women in the film industry subsequently reported similar experiences with Weinstein, who denied any non-consensual SEX. As a result of these allegations, Weinstein was dismissed from his production company, suspended from the British Academy of Film and Television Arts, and expelled from the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. He also resigned from the Directors Guild of America and was denounced by leading figures in politics whom he had supported. The Los Angeles Police Department opened a criminal investigation for alleged R, and New York and London police began investigating other SA allegations. On October 10, 2017, Weinstein's wife, Georgina Chapman, announced that she was leaving him. Their divorce was finalized in July 2021. Those bombshell SA claims against Weinstein didn't just fade away. Nope, they kicked off this whole national reckoning in the U.S., a tidal wave against harassment and A that got dubbed the Weinstein effect. Combine that with some other harassment cases earlier in the year, and you've got a full-blown storm. Thanks to the Weinstein reports and the hash Me Too movement exploding on social media, people started coming forward left and right, sharing their own stories of misconduct that had been tucked away. It wasn't just Hollywood feeling the heat. This avalanche of allegations reached across various industries. The result? Swift exits for many powerful dudes, not just in the US, but this thing spread like wildfire around the globe. The world suddenly felt like it was flipping the script on those who'd been abusing their power. In 2019, the documentary Untouchable was released with interviews from several of his accusers. The New York County District Attorney's Office charged Weinstein with R, Criminal SEX Act, SA and SEX misconduct for incidents involving two separate women on May 25, 2018. He was arrested the same day after surrendering to the New York City Police Department, NYPD, and released after a $1 million bail was posted on his behalf. He surrendered his passport and was required to wear an ankle monitor, with travel being restricted to New York and Connecticut. His lawyer, Benjamin Braffman, said Weinstein would plead not guilty. A trial date was set for January 6, 2020. On that date, Weinstein was also charged in Los Angeles with R wording one woman and SAing another in 2013. On June June 8, 2022, Weinstein was formally charged by the Metropolitan Police with two counts of indecent A against a woman in London between July 31st and August 31st, 1996. After deliberating for five days, a jury convicted Weinstein on February 24, 2020, of two of five criminal charges, one count of criminal SA in the first degree and one count of R in the third degree. The jury found him not guilty regarding predatory SA, which could have led to a life sentence. He was remanded to jail at Rikers Island in New York City pending his sentencing hearing on March 11th, when he was sentenced to 23 years in prison. He was then transferred to Wenda Correctional Facility in Erie County, New York. He stated through his attorneys that he would appeal the verdict. Weinstein was stripped of his honorary CBE, commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire, on September 18, 2020. On June 2, 2022, the New York State Supreme Court Appellate Division, First Department upheld the verdict and judgment on appeal. For the court's decision, Judge Angela Mazzarelli wrote, We perceive no basis for reducing the sentence, and we have considered defendants' remaining arguments and find them unavailing. On August 25, 2022, he was granted a further appeal before the New York Court of Appeals. On July 20, 2021, Weinstein was flown to Los Angeles and taken to the Twin Towers Correctional Facility. The trial in Los Angeles commenced in October 2022. Weinstein was charged with 11 counts of of R, forcible oral copulation and SEX battery, stemming from alleged acts between 2004 and 2013. He was found guilty of three of seven charges. Four of the initial 11 charges were dropped on December 19, 2022. Convictions included charges of R, forced oral copulation and third-degree SEX misconduct. On February 23, 2023, Weinstein was sentenced to 16 years in prison for these convictions. His sentence in California prisons must be served separately from, consecutively to rather than concurrently to, his time served in New York. Can you believe it? With all the crazy stuff about Weinstein, you'd figure someone as big shot as OPR would be steering way clear, right? But get this, according to TMZ, Weinstein spilled the beans saying OPR pushed him to defend himself publicly. Now that's raising some eyebrows. Was OPR actually riding shotgun with Weinstein against all these women? Hold up though, OPR camp hit back saying they never had a direct chat and she was just thinking about a TV interview. Plot twist, huh? And check this out. During her Golden Globe speech, OPR zipped it on the 
the Weinstein talk. But in other moments, she's been clear that this whole cultural shift isn't just about Weinstein. It's way bigger. OPR playing chess while the rest of us are just figuring out checkers. Another angle is that OPR goes on about how she's this big helper in the industry, claiming to be the force behind the success of black actors. But hold on a minute, because the controversies swirling around her make it look like she's doing the exact opposite of what she says. It's like she's playing a whole different game. Remember what Taraji spilled about OPR not really having the backs of black women in the industry as much as she claims? Well, that just adds another layer to the drama. After featuring an OPR movie The Color Purple, Taraji P. Henson came out to reveal that she was grossly underpaid for her role in the movie. Okay, let's break it down. So, the remake of Color Purple is in the hands of heavy hitters like Oprah's Harpo Films, Steven Spielberg's Amblin Entertainment, SGS Pictures, and Quincy Jones Productions. The same powerhouses that brought us the 1985 adaptation with OPR herself rocking the role of Sophia. Fast forward to the new rendition, where Danielle Brooks takes on Sophia, Fantasia steps into the shoes of protagonist Sally Harris, and Taraji owns the stage as Suge Avery. Now here's the kicker. You'd assume that with Taraji, a seasoned pro with more than two decades in the game, and a trophy case full of awards, fair pay wouldn't be a battle. Especially in a flick like The Color Purple, where OPR wearing the producer hat. But surprise, surprise, Taraji spilled the tea that OPR didn't exactly go to bat for her or the other leading ladies when it came to the paycheck. According to Taraji, the initial offer was downright disrespectful, and the big shots refused to budge until she laid down the ultimatum of walking away from the whole project. Can you believe it? Taraji, a force to be reckoned with, had to throw down to get what she deserved. And get this. Taraji is over it. She's had enough of the constant hustle for what's rightfully hers. In a recent heart-to-heart -heart with OPR BFF Gail King, Taraji spilled the beans and hinted that she might just throw in the acting towel for good. Why? Because she's straight up tired of the never-ending battle for fair pay. So, Gail tried to keep it light, but Taraji wasn't playing around. The conversation got real when Taraji opened up about the ongoing struggle for fair pay that black actress, even veterans like herself, still face in the industry. And let me tell you, Gail was squirming a bit because, well, Taraji was there to promote the color purple. And this wasn't exactly the feel-good chat they probably had in mind. Gail, doing her best to navigate through the discomfort, kept nodding and repeating that she gets what Taraji is laying down. But Taraji was having none of it. She dropped the bomb that she's seriously considering hitting the brakes on acting altogether. Why? Because she's tired, tired of busting her butt, being all gracious in her craft, and still getting paid peanuts. Taraji spilled, the math ain't may thing. Every time she smashes through a glass ceiling, it's like she never did it when the paycheck talks come around again. And here's where it got emotional. Taraji broke it down, saying she wants to fight for the up-and-coming actresses, be a voice for the next generation, but she's stuck in a loop of not getting what she deserves herself. It's a frustrating cycle, and you can hear the exhaustion in her voice as she explained, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. She's not just fighting for herself, she's trying to pave the way for those coming up behind her. I'm just tired of working. so hard, being gracious at what I do, getting paid a fraction of the cost. And if I can't fight for them coming up behind me, then what the f am I doing? I'm sorry. Also, Taraji called out the industry's double standard, where they shower you with praise for one project but act like they're broke when it's time for you to cash in. It's a raw and real moment, and it's clear that Taraji is just fed up with the whole game. Even before this recent interview bombshell, fans were picking up on the fact that Taraji didn't seem all that thrilled while promoting the color purple. You could practically feel the tension in the air, especially when it came to her interactions with OPR. Something was definitely off, and fans were quick to pick up on the not-so-happy vibes Taraji was giving off. Even, Cat Williams backed up Taraji in his recent interview on Shannon Sharp's podcast, and it's got everyone talking. He straight up said hearing Taraji spill about her treatment on The Color Purple was the saddest thing ever. Picture this. You're at the top of your game, no one can touch you in your lane. You're the go-to person, the big shot. But here's the kicker, they're not paying you what you're worth. Kat was like, imagine being so top tier that if they don't pick you for a role, there's literally no three black actresses bigger than you. But they're still not willing to bump up your pay. He spilled that he's been dealing with this for a whole decade, taking beatings and just going along with it. 
Finally, he decided, enough is enough. This is wrong, and we should be ashamed. And who can forget how Monique spent over a decade calling out OPR, Lee Daniels, and Tyler Perry, claiming they worked together to blackball her for not doing promotional press for the 2009 film Precious. Monique hit the stage at the Apollo Theater and went off on Tyler Perry, director Lee Daniels, and OPR Winfrey, accusing them of whiteballing her from Hollywood. She also said that the term blackballed isn't quite right in her book. In her words, she said, what is that black D connected to? That black man? So no, I was not blackballed. I was whiteballed by some black Ds who have no balls. Thank you, Mr. Lee Daniels. Thank you, Mr. Tyler Perry. Thank you, Miss Oprah Winfrey, she continued. See, I know they like to say, Monique, you talk too mother effing much. It would kill me not to say the real SHT. You are not paying me equally. You are not treating me fairly so you can f my D if I had one. What is that black dick connected to, that black man? So no, I was not black bold. I was white bold. <laughs> For context, back in 2009, Monique had a plan to do a press tour for the movie Precious, co-produced by OPR and Tyler Perry. They wanted to ride the wave of her Oscar nomination buzz, but here's the kicker. They weren't planning to pay her for the tour, and she was already drained from filming. Monique decided to skip the tour and take a breather with her family. Seemed like a straightforward call and everyone seemed cool with it. She said, OPR, I'm doing a talk show, I'm doing a comedy tour, I have a husband and I have babies, I have a little bit of downtime and I'm going to take advantage of it. So I'm not going anywhere because I'm not obligated to go anywhere. I've done my part. So we mutually agreed to disagree. That was it. Next thing I know, I am considered difficult and hard to work with. Fast forward a few weeks and bam, media stories start popping up, painting Monique as difficult to work with. Suddenly, no one wanted to cast her, despite her winning an Oscar for her role in Precious. Imagine seeing all your hard work go down the drain. Monique started putting two and two together, realizing someone was out to get her. In a recent chat with The Hollywood Reporter, she spilled the beans that Precious director Lee Daniels admitted she got blackballed for not playing the game. Monique's even called out OPR and Tyler Perry, asking for an apology that, as far as we know, is still MIA. Well, 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 it seems like Ice Cube might be onto something here. OPR has really rubbed a lot of folks in the industry the wrong way, and now the rumor mill is working over time, suggesting she's shaking in her boots about what Cat Williams might spill. The grapevine is even hinting at deeper and darker stuff we're not clued into yet, and who knows, maybe Cat is gonna spill the tea soon. But hey, I wanna know what you guys make of this whole drama. Drop your thoughts in the comments, and let's keep this conversation going. Catch you in the next video.